Welcome, First Church, to Wednesday night online. So glad you're able to join us today. Uh, we're going to continue our series on Fear Not this week. Today we're going to be talking about where you stand with God. Fear not. We've been looking at many instances. We first began our series with, with Mary and looking at Mary and the struggles it was being brought on by the Holy Ghost, a, a virgin, as being a virgin with a child. And, and then the next week we went on to Joseph and we, we spoke about Joseph and, and how that related to the, the Christmas story. And today we're, we're going to talk about the shepherds. The shepherds, they saw an angel and an angel appeared unto them. The fear I want to talk to you about is the fear that many of us have around the world, the fear of where do I stand with God. And for those of you that believe in God or for those of you that believe there's something after this life, there's more to it than what you may believe. Fear not, the shepherds asked, or the angel said unto the shepherds, what do you think will happen to me? What where do I stand in this life? Or where do I stand with God? I can't speak for the rest of you, but I can tell you that honestly, growing up as a child, I was terrified of what would happen to me. Or I was terrified of if I was good enough for God, if I was good enough to go to church. Or I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to go to hell. I, I wanted to make it to heaven, but was I doing everything correctly? Was I living the life that God wanted me to? Was I living the life that my parents had taught me to live? Or did I live a life worthy of being heaven bound? I just didn't know if I'd ever measure up to, to being with God in heaven. And so today we're going to look at another story, another fear not angel story. I believe this story is a very popular portion of the Christmas story, it speaks to us in a way that I believe could be a, a game changer. It comes to us as standing with God. So let's look at Luke chapter 2. We're going to read in verse number 8 through 11. There was a key player in this story, and it was the shepherds. And so, I, so help me out with this. There were, there were shepherds in the field, verse number 8. They were living out in a field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said unto them, Fear not. The King James Version translates fear, fear, it to fear not. My version says, Do not be afraid. I bring you what? I bring you good news. Our word gospel actually means Good news. In verse number 10, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, what is the good news? It's a Savior that has been born to you, the Messiah, the Lord. Today I bring you good news. Fear not, for a Savior has been born to you. Now some people ask, okay, what's, what's the good news? I mean, if we need a Savior, then what do we need saving from? Well, it's really interesting to me about this story is who the angels appear to. Now, for example, back in the time where Jesus lived, whenever a family would give birth to a child, it was common that if they had any financial means at all to hire a herald. What is a herald? That's a person that would go out and announce or, or would herald out the birth of their child. For example, if they had a first son, they would make a really big deal about it. Kind of like first, first parents do when, they, when they're having that first child. They, they want to get all the family together and they want to they celebrate and they want to um, pop balloons and see what the baby's going to be, the gender of the baby. A gender reveal party is kind of what you would say. A herald would come out and he would herald out or announce what the child was going to be born. And so they would, they would hire this herald out for, so that the good news of the child was being born. Well, that's just what God does. God sends an angel out to herald or to announce the good news. But what's really interesting is who God sends the angel to. Think about it. If the Son of God is being born on this earth, who do you think God would want to announce this to? If it was me, 
I would have wanted to announce it to all the kings, all the princes, everybody that's high up. I would want them to know of my son being born. If I had the choice of who I could send an angel to to announce it, I would want everybody to know. But Jesus chose quite the opposite. God being so humble and in humility, God sends an angel to make an announcement to some lowly shepherds. You may think, well, of course, because the nativity scene has shepherds and has wise men, and, and that's cool and all, but what you don't understand is the shepherds were one of the most disrespected groups of people. The job of a shepherd was so low that a father would, would give this job to his youngest son. It was even more often reserved for slaves or or, or, or for the lowly income people were shepherds. Shepherds were uneducated. They had no means of advancement in their career. You never hear of a shepherd but becoming something great. In fact, according to the religious system, shepherds were always rejected. The religious leaders taught that shepherds were not good enough for God and that they could never be made right with God. In fact, the shepherds could not live up to the religious rules and the religious parity of the day. And so it was, it was no wonder that they always worried about and lived in fear of where they stood with God. They felt distant. Now, why did they feel distant? I'll give you three reasons tonight. So if you're taking notes, you can write these down. Number one is they felt unworthy. The first reason the shepherds for felt distant from God is because they felt unworthy. Many of us feel this way. In fact, they were outcasts in Israel. And, and like I said, they were taught specifically, you are not good enough for religion. You are not good enough for God. And the reason is they were nomads. They were wanderers. They went from, from place to place, from, from field to field, shepherding sheep. And, and it's kind of like a trucker would go out, you know, for, for 10 days or so, and then he would he would finally come back home. A shepherd might be on the road for weeks or for months, and therefore they couldn't come back to the temple. They were they were always felt like they were on the outside, and they were never really apart. As you can imagine, they, they hung out with sheep. So how do you think shepherds smelled? They didn't smell good. There were no truck stops on the way for them to stop and freshen up or take a shower. And so they were physically dirty, but even more damaging to their soul religious people considered them spiritually dirty so much that a religious person would not even touch a shepherd because it would cause their 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 bodies to feel nasty and disgusting they would be considered spiritually unclean as well and so you can only imagine how unworthy that they felt the, re the reality is 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 that many of us can be as well become spiritually dirty and we try to come into church and we try to put on that, that church face. But you know the bad things that we've done. You know the bad things that, that I've done. We think, man, if I, if I know what I've done wrong, if I know the good things I should do and I don't do them, how could God love someone like me? How could God love someone that's done what I've done? How can he love a person like me? And then you look around at everyone else, especially at this time of year. You look around at family photos at the Christmas tree farm, or you look at family photos with Santa, and you think, oh, they all look so pretty. They all look so well put together. And, and you think, oh, I wish my family could be like that. And, and you begin to think of the, when on your way to church last Sunday morning, and you were fighting with the kids and you were yelling at them, hey, cut that out. You were yelling at the kids in the back and telling them, well, you know, I'm going to kill you before we get to church if you don't behave. Whatever it may have been, you're yelling at them, you're screaming, and then, and then you come into church and, oh, glory to God, thank you, Jesus. And how, how am I, how can I do this? How can I yell at my kids one minute and scream at them and almost kill them and, and, and their hair's all messy and they're not dressed right and we barely made it to church. And then you come into church and you're worshiping God like you got everything put together. I think I messed that one up. 
I feel so unworthy to be able to come into his presence and worship him. The shepherds felt that same exact way. They felt so unworthy to be in the presence of God. Number two is they felt inadequate. If you're taking notes, they felt very, very inadequate. They were uneducated, and so they felt like they never could measure up in society. It's amazing when we compare ourselves to other people how inadequate we can feel. Ladies, you go into your friend's home and their house is perfect. Their house smells like the best candle you can get from Bath and Body Works and the floor is clean, the, the kids' hair's brushed even before they go to bed. They're in their Christmas pajamas. You walk into your house and it smells disgusting. It smells like old dirty laundry. It smells like food's been sitting out on the table for a few nights. You don't even know what kind of floors you even have because of all the laundry spread out everywhere. You haven't seen a brush to brush your ha kid's hair in so long. You feel so inadequate. Even worse, spiritually, when they compare themselves, they felt very inadequate. One of the big rules was you had to keep the Sabbath day you had to take a day of total rest. And shepherds could not rest because they worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They felt like they were constantly spiritual failures. Sometimes we're like that. We look around at other people and they seem so close to God. They've got a Bible verse for everything. They, they pray the biggest prayers and, and you hear their prayers and you thought, wow, I wish I could pray like that. Or they're quoting books of the Bible. They're quoting scripture at every turn. And you think, I wish that I could do that. I didn't even know that verse was in the Bible. And their prayers, wow, man, they're so powerful. They bring down the glory of God. And you're thinking the last time I prayed, it was, it was like, God, just please help me to not kill this person in the aisle next to me in the grocery store. Or, or, or God, please help me not to get so angry at this person trying to take my parking spot. That was like me today when I went to Lowe's and the traffic was so crazy and cars were weaving out everywhere and people were blocking all the entrances to Lowe's. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's killing me. Why can't people just know how to drive in Louisiana? In Arkansas, they don't do that. Only in Lake Charles, Louisiana. People just don't know how to drive. And it just makes me, it just, ugh. I have to pray, right? They felt this way. I'm so unspiritual. You ever felt that way before? They, they felt very unworthy. They felt very inadequate. And sometimes we can feel that way too. I feel like a shepherd sometimes just because I don't feel worthy enough to, to be loved by God so much or I feel very inadequate about the, the life that I'm living or, or the way that, that I worship or the way that I pray or read my Bible. I just, I feel like I'm always so busy or there's, there's not enough hours in the day to give to God. And, and, that's, and that's not always true. And the shepherds, though, they felt that way and people viewed them that way. And the number three thing is they felt unloved. The third challenge that the shepherds would have had is they felt unloved. They felt very, very unloved. So unworthy, number one, inadequate, number two, and number three, unloved. In reality, most of the shepherds were thieves. And this is like a sad fact, but even the ones that weren't thieves were known as thieves. Anybody ever been called a thief and you thought, I've never stolen anything? Why would you call me that? And the shepherds felt this way. They were not trusted. People wanted to stay a far distance away from them. And in fact, they were so distrust, distrusted that a shepherd was never even allowed to give a testimony in a court case because no one would trust them. They were incredibly unloved. The reality is so tragically that that's the way many of us feel today. We may be some of us tonight that are watching online that our, our, one of our parents left us as a kid and, 
and you were wondering, so you, so you think, what, what's wrong with me? You know, what, why couldn't dad stick around? Or is it, was it me or, or, and mom? I mean, what, what went wrong that he wouldn't love me or he wouldn't take care of me? There may be some of you that are going to have Christmas this year without your spouse or, or without a parent. They felt unloved. You ever felt that way? Many of us have many instances or circumstances where we, where we question that. Am I loved? Does anyone love me? Does God love me? I did the best I could. I feel very unloved. Some of you may look in a mirror and, and don't like the person looking back at you. I've, I've been there. As a senior in high school, or a junior in high school actually, I had a disease come across my body and my face, and, and I remember going from doctor to doctor and nothing, nobody being able to do anything about it. And I w we went to God and we prayed and prayed and nothing ever happened. And it was, it was so bad I would cry as a junior in high school because I didn't want to go to school. And I remember standing in the mirror. Perception on a day like this in church you can look all around and you could think, well, he's got it all together. And that's not always true. Everybody that doesn't have it all together, everybody has their own struggles in life. Everybody has their own mirror they're looking into. I'm so messed up. I'm so unlovable. No one could ever love me. No one will ever see me the way I would hope so. The shepherds felt that exact same way. You have no idea the pain of the people sitting on the road right next to you in church or right around you right now, even in your home as you're listening online. There could be just a few seats down from you when you get here on the 20th on Sunday morning in our beautiful new sanctuary, a single mom who's about ready to throw in the towel to cash it all in because she feels so inadequate, so unworthy, and so unloved. She thinks that I cannot do this at all. If it weren't for my children that I have, if I wish I, I wouldn't even be here. They're keeping me here, but I can't keep it all together. I don't have what it takes. Right in front of you on this on this day you're watching online, or even when you get here on the 20th, there, there may be a guy sitting right in front of you who's doing the best he can to worship God, to worship Him with all that he has, but he feels so inadequate. He feels so unworthy, so unloved. He's struggling financially just to keep it together. He knows that when his kids go back to school that someone's going to say, hey, what did you get for Christmas? And these kids are not going to want to lie because they didn't get too much. He wanted to give to them, but he didn't have the means. He wasn't financially able to, to get them that new bike or to get them that new video game they wanted. He feels like a complete failure, but he's trying his best to worship God. There's someone else, maybe even sitting close to you also, who's single and all their friends are married and they're going, what about me? How come no one, I haven't found anyone or no one loves me like that? I mean, I'm trying to be a good person and be a Christian. I'm serving and I'm involved and I'm trying to be an effective person, yet no one seems to want. What's wrong with me? You may be sitting there and with someone real successful right beside you has more money than you or, or more things than you, but inside they're carrying such a burden, so much pain, and they, they, they feel like they have, it, they have it all together, but deep down in their heart there's something so incredibly wrong and they're hurting so much that they just want to give up. They have no one to open up to because everyone thinks they're, they have it all together, but they're unworthy inadequate, unloved. The bottom line is religion did not work for the shepherds. It made them feel even more distant from God. Religion did not work for the shepherds, and religion doesn't work for us. 
It takes getting close to God, a personal investment, a personal relationship with God. You may say, well, wait, 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 wait. Well, I thought, I thought you were a preacher of the gospel. I mean, what are you saying? It's, it's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying God did not come to bring religion into the world, but in so many ways to set us free from religion and to give us something better. You see, the problem with religion is religion reduces Christianity just down to rules, to do's and, and to don'ts. If I, if I do the right thing, I feel so much better about myself. But if I don't do the right thing and if, if I do the wrong thing, then I feel so bad about myself. I'm, I, am I okay? I mean, I must be a good person because I, I, don't, I don't drink. I, I, I don't smoke. I, I, I don't do what, what, what everybody else is doing. I'm trying my very best to, to live for God and, and to be holy and to be righteous. And I, I just don't feel good enough. Or I feel like I'm, I'm obeying all the rules. And Jesus looked at this behavior and he said this, it makes me want to puke. He said to the Pharisees, he said this, you're so focused on the outside and the outside is filthy. The outside looks clean. The inside where it matters is filthy. He said, you missed the whole point. You see, religion didn't work for the shepherds and it doesn't work for us. It's because Christianity was never meant to be a religion but it was meant to be a relationship. Christianity wasn't meant to be religion, but relationship with God. That's why God said, I have to go. That's why God made himself a man by putting on flesh. It's, that's the good news. God came down to this world in the form of a baby named Jesus to save us from our sins, to give us a man to have a relation Ship with You say, well, if this is good news, if there's a Savior, then what does that mean for me today? Well, how does that apply for, for today? I want to show you. In a few of the clearest verses in all the Bible, written by the Apostle Paul, it says, it says this. Well, well, before Paul was, let me, let me read you this. Before Paul was a follower of Jesus, do you know what he thought about Christians? He hated them. He killed them when he could. He was a leader against Christians. Some of you may feel like that today, but when he met the love of God, when he fell into that relationship with God, he was so transformed that he became one of the greatest representations of Christ in history. Here's what he said. I would describe this as the, as the good news in the Bible, but certainly... It's, it's really important. He said in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. You have no idea how good this is because the law simply shows us how sinful we are. But what has God done? Verse 21, it says, God has now shown us the way to be made right with Him. Here's the good news without keeping the requirements of the law. What does that mean? We are, verse 22, we are made right with God, not by observing the law, but by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Let's break it down to this, three, in, in, in three simple, simple explanations. Number one, the good news is you cannot earn God's acceptance by observing the law. You cannot be good enough for God by trying to obey all of the laws. This was such good news for the shepherds because they lived in a society where the Pharisees tried to obey 613 laws. Could you imagine going to church and they given you a piece of paper when you walked in the door and said, you can't be loved, you can't feel like you're a part unless you follow all 613 of these rules. How many of you would be in church today? Their occupation prohibited them 
from being able to obey the law in this way. They couldn't be apart because they were always in the fields 24 hours a day and seven days a week. They, they, they never could really fall into a deep relationship with God because there, there was no time and no one liked them. No one wanted them to be there. The good news is that you can't even do it even if you tried. Verse 20 says, For no man can ever be made, say it with me, be made right with God by doing what the law commands. So why do we have the law? What's the law even there for? Number one, you cannot earn God's acceptance by observing the law. Number two is, what's the purpose of the law? It is to show you that you need a Savior. Amen? We need a Savior. Let's look at verse 20 one more time. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Why is the law here? The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Think about it. The law reveals our need for a Savior. Just because it's Christmas time and we're, we're nearing the, the week of Christmas, I want to I help show us just how bad of people we really are. I want to show me just how bad of a person I really am. And this is going to be a little bit crazy, but you can do it in your home. Uh, just don't raise your hand because you don't want your family members judging you or your friends. But we're going to do it. How many of you listening tonight have ever told a lie? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you have ever told a lie? How many of you have ever stolen something? Not necessarily from a store. Maybe you picked up something that wasn't yours. That's stealing. Right? You've stolen something? Don't raise your hand. You don't want your wife knowing that you took something that was hers. You don't want your husband knowing. Or kids, you don't want mom and dad knowing you, you swiped something on, on accident. So, so, so now we could be a liar or we could be a thief. How many, here's now the third one. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you have ever looked lustfully at someone? How many of you have ever looked at that girl walking down the road and thought, oh, she's, she's cute? Or, or, or you saw that, that guy and you thought, man, that guy's got big muscles and he's, he looks strong. He's handsome. Have you ever done that before? The Bible says that if you've looked lustfully, you've done what? You've committed adultery. Okay, so now, if you've told a lie, what are you? You're a liar. If you've ever stolen something, what does that make you? A thief. If you've ever looked lustfully at someone, that makes you an adulterer. So basically, First Pentecostal Church of Lake Charles, we are full of lying, thieving adulterers. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you. Amen. We're so glad you're a part. We hope we, you feel so good about yourself right now while you're watching online. I apologize for, for that example, but it's just an example to show us that we're not perfect. And we're, we're in such a need of a Savior. It, it's so important, you can't miss it, that we have to see ourselves as sinners. You can't, you can't walk around this, this earth and... And you can't walk around Lake Charles with your chest poked out thinking, I'm so good and I'm so great and I'm perfect. No, 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 no. We mess up every single day. Every day we do something wrong. Every day when we wake up, we have to make sure that we fall in love with that relationship with God. And we say, God, please forgive me of all my sin. God, turn, turn this life around right now. God, I need you desperately. I need you to come into my life and help me walk on this journey you got to know and understand that you're a sinful man and that you're in need of a Savior. We need His mercy. We need His grace every morning. Amen, amen. 
when you realize you need a Savior, you're going to recognize that religion cannot save you. You're going to recognize that you're a sinner that needs to be saved by grace. You won't be looking for salvation through religion, but you'll be looking through for salvation through a Savior. 2,000 years ago, a Savior was born. Indeed, Christianity was never meant to be religion, but it was meant to be a relationship with the loving God who sent His Son to reveal just how good He is. The good news, the good news is you cannot be good enough for God by observing the law. Well, so what's the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is to show our need for a Savior. So how are we made right with God? How can we ever be made right with Him? Number three is the good news teaches us this. R righteousness with God comes by faith in Christ alone. It's not Christ plus religion. It's not Christ plus church membership. It's not Christ plus giving money to the church. It's not Christ plus good work. It's Christ plus nothing. How about that for a math problem? It's Christ plus zero. It's putting our faith in Christ alone. This is verse 22. We are made right with God by doing what? We are made right with God by placing our faith in Him. How are we made right with God? By placing our faith in Him. This is true for everyone who believes in Him, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done. The angel appeared unto the shepherds, the people that religion rejected, the people that no one else wanted. The angel appeared unto them and said these two words, Fear not. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born unto you. How are you made right with God? By putting your faith in Him. When you realize this, when you realize the shepherds felt just like we do, unworthy, inadequate, and unloved, but fear not, the Bible says, for today in the town of David, a Savior has been born unto you. And so no matter how bad you've been, no matter how bad you've messed up, no matter how alone you may feel, how unloved you may feel, just read it again. Read that verse again. We are made right with God, not by good works, not by religion, but by placing our faith in Him. This is true for everyone. Let's say, let's say that last part together. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, we are made right with God. That is the good news. No matter who you are, a Savior has been born. His name is Jesus, and He is the Lord. I can see myself as a, as a shepherd, wandering and trying to find my place and, and wandering throughout the church. Maybe you even wander around the altar at altar time, saying, God, do you really love me? Do you really care about me? And I'm here to tell you tonight, on this Wednesday night, online in your living room that God loves you more than you could ever imagine. That God cares about your circumstance. God cares about your situation. God understands and God, God cares in, during this season of where you are. God loves you no matter what anyone else says. God loves you no matter where you feel you stand with Him. If you even feel that God could never love you, that you feel that you've messed up so bad. I'm here to tell you that the King of kings and the Lord of lords was born in a lowly manger and he lived a life and he died on a cross for you and for your sin. And tonight you can receive that. Tonight you can have his spirit living inside you this Christmas season. He can give you joy this Christmas season. He can put a smile on your face today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God loves you today. He cares about you. No matter how you are viewed or how you view yourself, God's sending an angel into your home right now. The angel's swooping down right now in your neighborhood and in your living room 
to tell you, fear not, for a Savior has been born. Fear not, you are loved. Fear not, I care about you. An angel, I hope you can feel him right now. I hope you can feel the presence of God in your living room. If you just lift your hands up to him right now, there's an angel coming down and he's here to wrap you in his loving arms. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. God, thank you for, for being born in this, in this season. Thank you for being born and loving me, God. Thank you for thinking about the shepherds. Thank you for thinking about the unloved, the inadequate, the unworthy. God, that's how I feel. I feel like a shepherd. I feel like one of those. But God, I'm thankful to be a part of your family. I'm thankful that you don't look over me. I'm thankful that you see me right where I am. And you say, you mean so much to me that I'm coming after you, that I'm calling after you, I'm visiting you. I want you to be a part of my birth. I want you to be a part of my Christmas story. That's how Jesus feels. He loves you so much. He cares about you. Don't give up. Don't give up. We invite you here on the 20th, December the 20th at 10 a.m. God hasn't given up on you yet. God wants to see you here this, on this next Sunday morning. And God's gonna meet you here and he's gonna wrap you in his loving arms. And he's gonna say, I love you so much. I care about you. God's gonna set your feet on solid ground. When you may feel like your life is sinking so fast, God's gonna give you a place to stand. He's gonna show you a place of repentance. And, and he's gonna forgive you of all your sins. God can baptize you with his blood. He can wipe away all the sins that you've ever committed. God can give you the spirit of the Holy Ghost. He can have your, his spirit living inside of you. And what a great testimony that could be. Someone who felt so unloved and so unworthy, inadequate, felt like no one even cared about them and you could walk into a church family. Oh, you could walk right into a relationship with a loving God. That can happen this Sunday. That can happen right now where you are if you'll just lift your hands to Him. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We hope to see you here on the 20th, on this Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We hope you've enjoyed this series, Fear Not, the last few weeks. We've really enjoyed teaching it to you. It's been such a great, great lesson. And, and we hope that this Sunday morning you can invite someone to bring with you. Invite that neighbor. Invite that lady you met at the grocery store. Invite that coworker that, that you see sitting alone and, and you may know their story. Tell them about how God loves them. Tell them about the story of the shepherds. Tell them about Mary and Joseph. Tell them fear not, for a savior has been born for you. Bring them with you. We hope that we can see you here at December the 20th at 10 a.m. at First Pentecostal Church of Lake Charles. We love you, have a great week. It's gonna be awesome in Jesus' name.